Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of 14th to 20th of December 2020. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host John Deville. Before getting into this week's episode, I would like to send a special thanks to our friends at GoTikonauts and also at SpaceWatch.Global, two excellent sources for space news. This week, we're going to discuss the return of the Chang'e 5 lunar capsule, the a new IFC joint venture between a couple of major players in the industry. But first, Jean will give us an update on a scrubbed Long March 8 launch, which may or may not occur before the airing of this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. Jean, tell us about this upcoming Long March 8 launch. Sure. So actually today, this morning, we were supposed to witness the very first launch of the Long March 8 uh, at Wenchang Launch Center um, in, in, in Hainan. So that's one of the southern islands of of China, but unfortunately the launch was scrubbed because due to very poor weather conditions and um, very likely for at least um, 48 hours, we probably still see the the launch uh, in the next co- coming days, but we don't have a no time yet to confirm when that will happen. Um, anyway, on this, um, on this launch, there was supposed to be uh, five payloads. So first of all, a major payload, which um, is a classified Earth observation technology satellite that was built by CAST, and that was dubbed um, XJY-7, so Xin Ji Ru Yanzhou in Chinese, meaning technology verification um, satellite. As mentioned, we really don't know anything about this satellite. It's um, it, it's, it's classified uh, apart from the, the fact that it's destined to Earth observation. So that was the main payload. And there were... A, a lot of there were four side payloads. So the first one being a, an Ethiopian satellite called ETH Sat 6U that was co-developed with by with a Chinese company called um, Beijing Smart Satellite. There was also a satellite called Tianqi 12, which is part of Guodian Gaoke's um, IoT uh, low Earth orbit constellation. And Guodian Gaoke definitely has been deploying um, its constellation at a very fast pace um, this year. And ultimately, there were also two satellites coming from Space T, which is a satellite manufacturer, a small satellite manufacturer based in, in Changsha in China. And one of the satellites is destined to CTC. It's called Haisi One, and the other one um, is is um, for internal purposes. It's a technology verification satellite. So. Altogether, five satellites. Now, the Long March 8 completes um, the list of new generation launch vehicles that you have in China, which are comprised of Long March 5, 6, and 7, beyond the Long March 8. All these other rockets are um, already operational. So really, Long March 8 is the final addition uh, to this family, bringing an extra capability of um, four to five tons into central synchronous orbit. So uh, more or less filling the gap between Long March 6 and Long March um, 7, I would guess. Um, and so one could ask, what is new with the Long March 8? And when you look at the parts uh, that compose Long March 8, you realize that it's um, it's really based on, it's it's really a modular architecture and based on a lot of proven technology. Uh, for example, you have the YF-100 Kerlox engine that's powering the core stage and the side boosters. And this is um, equipment, this is uh, engines that was used already on the Long March 5, 6, and 7. And the upper stage is the YF-75 which is a Hydrolox engine already employed on um, Long March 5, as well as um, historically Long March 3. Um, so altogether, it's it's proven technology. But the interesting point is that um, CAST revealed in 2018 that their very first shot at reusability would be with this um, rocket with the Long March 8. And this would, um, well, the first launch, the launch that we're supposed to witness in a couple of days, um, will be expendable. And this is because um, to make this rocket um, reusable, um, CALT and CASC will definitely have to do a lot of modifications to make it work. So when we look on paper, what they revealed in 2018, they showed a video where we see that the rocket would um, basically do what SpaceX is doing with the Falcon 9 and other, you know, other reusable rockets uh, around the planet, which is, well, using grid fins, using extendable legs. But there's one notable specificity, which is that the boosters would um, stay with the core booster and come down together um, as one for the ver- vertical landing phase. And just one last thing also I'd like to mention is that this, um, this reusable version of the of Long March 8 will only come along um, approximately 2025 from what I get from the um, 
from the Chinese and English media. And this is um, this is because Callot and Cask have a lot of work to do. So beyond just the whole attitude uh, control of the vertical landing phase, um, there's also some modifications to do to the engines. Uh, typically, the Y100 is I don't think was designed initially for reusability. Um, and when you when you land vertically, you need to throttle very significantly your engine. So that's the first thing. There are modifications um, to the engine. And the second point is that when you look at the engine layout of typically um, a Falcon 9, but also what um, Chinese commercial launch companies are doing, you realize that they have this star-shaped cluster of engines. So you have multiple engines. And the idea is that when you have more engines, each engine individually doesn't need to produce as much thrust. That means that during the landing phase, when you reignite some of the engines, um, you don't need to throttle them so much. But when you look at the layout of the Long March 8, you realize that they only have two engines in the core stage, which means that if when they reignite, they would need to throttle very significantly um, the um, the engine to, to produce less thrust. So it's it's not impossible. We've seen a SpaceX, for example, with the SN8 do it with just um, three engines for the, that, that Starship prototype um, a couple days back. So it's it's possible. They almost landed successfully. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's going to be a lot of design effort and testing for for Cal. So it's on one hand, it's it's a very um, it's proven technology, Long March 8. But at the same time, it's also really this 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 gateway uh, for Cask into something that's completely new to them, which is um, the, the realm of reusable rockets. Definitely an interesting uh, interesting update as it relates to reusable rockets. Also on, on this Long March 8, I think it's um, it's noteworthy that it is it is launching from Wenchang, which as far as I know is the only uh, Chinese launch center that has really kind of this, um, you know, uh, tourist destination element to it. So as we mentioned in previous episodes, um, for some of the Long March 5 launches, you've seen kind of a lot of Chinese space fans making pilgrimages down to Hainan Island and basically just making a vacation out of this, th- you know, three-day launch window. And the Long March 5, of course, is is relatively rarely launched. I think it's only been launched, what, four, four-ish times or so since... Um, since inception. So it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, the, the Long March 8 also being launched from Wenchang, whether you start to see um, pilgrimages also for, for that. And, and certainly I think it, it's kind of, um, it relates somewhat to this, you know, space becoming more kind of popular generally, that this there's this, this sort of space tourism element to, to the launches. Um, I would also, I guess, I point out just the the diversity of the customers on this launch. I mean, as as you mentioned, there was the sort of government anchor customer with this classified Earth observation payload, but then you had the um, you had a couple of different commercial Chinese space companies. You had the Ethiopian satellite that was developed with Beijing Smart Satellite, which, as it turns out, they were founded in 2018. So here we are, two and a half years after their founding and they're already launching satellites with the Ethiopians. And then we also saw uh, CETC, which is you know a major SOE. So really um, quite a few players from very different parts of the value chain, all um, you know being, being customers on this upcoming launch. I, I guess it would also, and I, I, I have no idea, and I don't think any of us will ever know, but it would be interesting to know, um, you know how does the launch cost here for, let's say, a Beijing smart satellite compare to launching on, say, a Kuaizhou 1A or uh, potentially even a commercial launcher, um, I guess being the first launch of the Long March 8, maybe there's some discount, I guess, for whatever increased risk there would be. Um, but yeah, overall, I think definitely it's um, there, there's a, a, a microcosm of many of the different trends that we've seen in the Chinese space industry over these last few years up on this upcoming launch. Just this internationalization, uh, this kind of diversification of the industry where you now have commercial companies and you have sort of non-CASC SOEs like CETC that are getting increasingly involved in the space sector. So definitely, I think, a a good sign of just kind of the diversification of the industry. Um, And then you also just want one last point that I would would highlight, and and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but just sort of the modularity of this new family of rockets that that China has developed. And I think it's been the the development of this new family has been a fairly, um, I don't want to say slow, although it's been, let's say, deliberate process. And I think part of this uh, this sort of modularity element, it, it will allow, as these technologies get proven, it will allow them to, to ramp up relatively uh, more quickly, potentially, the, this family of rockets. So so definitely looking forward to seeing um, this launch over the next couple of days. I think it's going to be something, uh, something to, and again, we'll see whether we get lots and lots of social media posts from people who have made the pilgrimage down to, uh, to Hainan to watch the Long March 8. So 
that'll be that'll be interesting. So on the topic of social media and events that just captivate the uh, the world, Jean, would you like to give us uh, the summary of the Chang'e 5 return that uh, that just happened this past week? Sure. So so this week was really the final week of the Chang'e 5 mission, which was a rather short mission when you compare it to Chang'e 4 or 3. I mean, the other missions uh, have I mean are still undergoing for for most for for I mean to some extent. Uh, Chang'e 5 is over this week. It's lasted uh, maybe 4 or 5 weeks. Um, so this week we had the Chang'e 5 re-entry capsule re-enter the atmosphere. So that was, I think that was on the 16th of December, sometime in the evening, although it'd be early morning on the Chinese side. And so it landed in Inner Mongolia and very rapidly the research team that were dispatched and uh, with equipped with helicopters and infrared cameras um, to locate the capsule. So the capsule was located and then it was brought back to the CAS facilities, which would, I think, presumably be in Beijing. All of this was live streamed um, and was um, and was wa- it could be watched um, through the Chinese media. So th- that was really really fascinating to watch and a lot of great images and live updates. So so really good job on, on CGTN and other media for, for that. Um, and what we had yesterday, so December 19th, there was a ceremony where we saw a number of Chinese scientists take out um, the, um, basically the container c- containing the lunar samples out of the capsule. And there was this weighing ceremony in front of um, journalists where they, they actually measured the amount of samples that they had got back. And it was something around 1.7 kilograms or slightly below the two t- kilograms that they were um, aiming for. But um, really, it's it's. I think it was also considered as really an ample amount to do a lot of um, scientific studies. And so no doubt in the coming weeks, um, Chinese scientists will start to work um, and investigate these lunar samples, uh, possibly with a focus on the future focal points of uh, Chinese um, lunar missions, which are going to be uh, in situ um, resources utilization, um, how to harvest energy on the moon, I would guess also space agriculture, um, and, and probably many other topics. So yeah, I think this is this mission was definitely the the cherry on the cake for the for a very active um, year for China in, in in just space in general. Um, there's Chang'e five, but there's there was also um, a few months ago there's the launch of um, Tian One One for 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 Mars. Um, there was you know the test flight of their um, um, you know their next generation um, crewed spacecraft that was long launched uh, uh, on board a Long March Five B. Um, really, so much has been going on, and um, I think in terms of number of launches, we're also reaching not a record year. I think we're shy of maybe two or three launches, but we're really um, closing in on the ma- historical maximum, which I think was um, 2018 with um, 39 launches. So, um, so anyway, yeah, that's Chang'e five um, for for this week. And and of and of course, when you when you consider the the coronavirus this year, it's uh, still mm-hmm. a, a pretty impressive year to be just two launches shy of, of 2018. Although, I mean, it's been pretty. I mean, it's, it's been pretty amazing hearing about the extent to which things are just completely back to normal now in China, especially when I compare it to being in Chicago right now. That's uh, quite a, quite a contrast. But um, yeah, so I, I think on, on Chang'e 5, another really interesting thing to, to watch was, as, as you mentioned, kind of the live stream. And it was not only on, on Chinese media, but also on YouTube, although it was in, in Chinese. But but um, I, I was watching on YouTube as as the teams were were kind of going in to retrieve the, the sample in, in Inner Mongolia. And it was just... I mean, it, I, I might get I might get sanctioned for this, but the closest thing I could I could compare it to was watching when when the CIA killed bin Laden in, in, at night and they just had people with night vision and you could just see people running into a house. And, and it was just that's kind of a f- up and up. <laughs> anyway, um, digressing, I, I think you could I mean, just the 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 live stream on YouTube was was pretty impressive. And also, I think. Um, Interesting timing with the the Hayabusa two capsule also coming back around the same time, and I just remember seeing a photo on Twitter of a, a Japanese scientist with white gloves, kind of holding this uh, this this capsule of uh, of asteroid rock. So, so a lot of space stuff coming uh, you know coming out these these couple of months. Um, also noticed a few more high definition videos on on you know YouTube on Twitter via Billy Billy of the the Trunga five coverage. Um, I would also point out, as, as I always like to do when talking about you know good media that that's created by by Chinese space missions uh, from the Chang'e four mission, some amazing photos from the Longjiang satellites that we will put in the in the show notes. Some really really great uh, photos. One last comment on on the Chang'e five, and then we can we can go over to our last uh, item of the week. I think this is just another example of um, the Chinese space program being 
Well, it's it's very large. I mean, when you compare, you know, uh, globally, the probably the only national level space program that is larger than China would be the U.S. And I think as space becomes more popular and as more countries want to have some access to space, there's only going to be a limited number of countries that can do these very, very big ticket missions like, you know, space stations or Mars missions, this kind of thing. And I think what we're going to see is that, you know, China will probably be one such country. And I think there will be a lot of countries that will want to, again, become involved in space and that will find that collaborating with China is is one way to do that. And uh, the, the one specific example that I would give is the the sort of follow-on mission to Chang'e 5, the Chang'e 6, which was kind of a a backup in the event that Chang'e 5 did not work out, although it has now since worked. But Chang'e 6, uh, there will be collaboration with um, with 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 Kness, I believe, with the French Space Agency. Um, and and again, this is um, not to say that France could not do their own Chang'e 6 mission, but but the fact that China is mm-hmm. is doing it, uh, I suppose, it gives France a good opportunity to collaborate. And I think we've also seen a couple of other European space powers collaborate with China on on similar missions. I think the Austrians maybe had something on Chang'e or possibly the Germans. Mm. Um, but yeah, so again, I, I think as as we see more countries want to participate in space, I, I do think that China's uh, just sort of the size of their space program and the the diversity of their space program is, is really going to allow them to um, to be kind of, to, to, I guess, control kind of that platform mm. that they could allow others to collaborate mm. on. And I, I would agree with, with um, the point you just mentioned on cooperation. I think a lot of uh, space powers, even space powers like France or, or Italy, which are probably one of the largest um, space budgets in the world, if you exclude um, the US and, and, and China, of course, um, even these countries, um, they, while they can they can have full fledged missions that are managed on, on their own or in the in the, within the framework of ESA, um, I don't think they will able to to you know touch every single domain that um, space explo- exploration offers, and definitely they will have to choose their fights, which means that cooperation is definitely something that's very attractive for them. Um, and I think typically where an area where France and other European countries are choosing their 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 fights is um, I'm thinking of um, like a crude space flight. Typically, uh, this is something that is not really done on their own, um, even in the ESA framework, and it's in, done in cooperation with the U.S. So, um, lunar exploration and potentially China's future lunar lunar station in the 2030s. This could be potential points of cooperation in the future with um, space powers uh, in Europe and. Um, and um, I mean, this is even more true with um, with other space countries, faring countries that have smaller budgets. Very true, as you said, picking one's battles. Because after all, France, despite being you know it's a big space power, but they still have less people than uh, let's say Hunan or Anhui or Hebei. I'm just having a look at the provincial population tables. So it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to match that, I suppose. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, so shall we move over to IFC and to a new joint venture? Sure. So uh, a tad of aviation in this week's episode. On the 16th of December, we saw China Eastern, uh, Junyao Group and China Telecom announce um, the creation of, of a new joint venture called Katie Link or um, Kong Di Hulian in Chinese. And as its Chinese name suggests, uh, that will be focused on the connected aircraft. So China Eastern is uh, one of the big three state owned Chinese airlines. In China, with its hubs, main hubs um, based in Shanghai, Junyao Group is also a very large group that's based in Shanghai and that has activities ranging from finance, manufacturing, and technology, and perhaps more of interest. Uh, they also have an airline called Junyao Airlines, which has a number of connected aircraft. And we also have so the third member of the um, joint venture is um, China Telecom. China Telecom is the oldest telco um, in China. And it historically has the role, although not exclusively of distributing um, connectivity to um, to Chinese commercial aircraft. Um, so um, also worth noting, sorry, China Telecom is one of the five companies in China uh, that have the license to distribute satellite capacity along with um, the other two telcos, which are China, China Unicom, China Mobile, as well as China Satcom and CTTIC. Now, the press release really doesn't discuss too much about what the joint venture Katie Link is going to be about. They mention things like, you know, product innovation, technology innovation, new applications, but that really doesn't tell us very much. But if we try to read in between the lines, we know that China Eastern um, is one of really the pioneering members, uh, pioneering airlines in China that are 
that um, have been bringing IFC to um, the, the Chinese aviation market. And when you look at the connected aircraft in China, in China, basically half of all the connected aircraft in China are within the China Eastern fleet. And Junior Airlines, the other airline within this JV, is also an airline that has a number of connected aircraft. So very likely, I think that um, this could potentially meet a new wave of uh, deployment of connectivity among the fleet of these two, um, two airlines. And, I probably satellite connectivity. Um, now, despite this deployment, it is not very clear what this new joint venture, Katie Link, is actually going to bring in terms of value. Um, but I, I believe very likely it is going to focus on working on strengthening the business case of IFC, which is not so good currently, not just in China, but around the world. Um, it's hard to make money out of IFC. And um, well, in, in, if we just look at China, the business case is especially unfavorable. And when you look at the, especially when you look at the um, the number of connected in aircraft in China, it's less than ten percent of the entire um, commercial fleet. So, so not so good, and definitely not so good when you compare it to more mature markets such as Euro Europe, and um, and especially the U.S. So, um, so that's that. And the last point I'd like to mention is I I think there's a good question of if this um, this joint venture is going to trigger a sort of a domino effect uh, among the other airlines, which we know all a great number of them are also interested in IFC, we've seen um, over the six to eighteen months and even beyond that a number of trials um, taking place and you know testing of equipment, and so maybe there could be a domino effect. I don't know where other airlines follow suit when they see their competitors really just generalizing um, in flight connectivity to their to their fleet. So. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a open question. It is definitely an open question. I think so. To your point about the the, the Chinese IFC industry in general being relatively underdeveloped, I, I suppose that's probably. I mean, there's a few different reasons, but I guess the biggest reasons would probably be what extremely conservative oligopolistic airlines, a relative lack of satellite capacity that would be suitable for IFC, uh, and then probably maybe the lack of a very, very strong domestic IFC service provider could be another factor. And and I think in terms of the satellite capacity picture, that's probably not going to be solved in the next two years. But China SATCOM does have plans to launch a lot of KA band capacity in 2023 on uh, China Sat 19 and 26, as we discussed a few weeks ago. But I think the um, the element of this that, that is most intriguing is this idea that Again, there's not really a, a a particularly strong turnkey satellite IFC service provider in China right now, and I don't know if this joint venture will you know, become that such service provider. But but certainly, um, it 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 is conceivable that a company like China Eastern that has a very large fleet that sees a very big market and that is a, it's a big company. It's twenty billion U.S. dollar per year revenue company with a lot of, of uh, support from the state. Um, whether they think, well, you know, why not us? There's lots of airlines in China and none of them are really making the move. And it, it reminds me a little bit. Um, so uh, Air Asia, the uh, Malaysian budget carrier, they I think they used to. I don't know if they still do have a subsidiary called Rocky. And that Rocky subsidiary was basically focused on developing, I think it was IFAC, although it may have been IFC solutions uh, for the Air Asia fleet, but then also selling those solutions to other carriers in the Asia Pacific region. So this idea of, you know, the airline says, well, we might as well sort of vertically integrate and take some of this in-house and um, and then see if we can sell it to, uh, to some of our competitors, as it were. So yeah, it'll be uh, it'll certainly be interesting to see where this uh, this JV goes, and and certainly there is a lot of demand for in-flight connectivity in China. It's just a question of who will pay for it, and uh, well, yeah, who will pay for it? I guess a little bit surprised that we did not see a major tech company involved in in this uh, in this JV, but um, I guess Tencent has been a little bit involved in the IFC or mm. IFX space, right? With uh, they had to deal with Hainan Airlines and. Um, uh, it was Donica as well. Donica, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But uh, certainly, we will be on the lookout for KD Link and uh, and what they are up to. Anything else, John, on the IFC update? Nope, I'm all good. 
Okay, so just one last news item of the week. It's a little bit uh, outside of our usual scope, but I saw it and I thought it was pretty interesting. So uh, Chinese search engine, sort of the Google of China, Baidu, uh, is considering making its own electric vehicles or or partnering with uh, one of several automakers um, to make vehicles. And this was reported by CNBC, among others, earlier this week. It was quoting three people with knowledge of the source, although it, uh, with knowledge of the, the information, although they, did, they were not able to get comment from Baidu. Um, but a couple of points about this that I would highlight. So Baidu is, again, it's sort of the Google of China. They have a lot of other uh, auxiliary businesses. One of the other things that they do is they are quite, um, quite advanced in, in self-driving car technology. And their CEO, Robin Lee, was one of the first, probably the first billionaire or kind of you know very powerful business tycoon in China to talk about the need for commercial space or for the you know for the space industry in China to have more commercial involvement, to have more private money. Um, and I would also point out that this uh, this announcement from uh, regarding Baidu mentioned that Baidu is considering partnering with with Geely for this development of these electric vehicles. So if we really want to speculate and if we really want to think very far out into the future, we, we might connect these dots and say, well, Geely has considered building their own uh, satellite network to as a sort of um, uh, enhanced satellite navigation kind of connectivity sort of play. And Baidu, with their self-driving car technology, uh, and you know, wanting to to develop the space industry, we might see some crazy collaboration in the very long term between uh, Baidu and Geely to help bring us our self-driving cars that are all connected from from space. Wouldn't that be something? Um, but digressing, interesting news from uh, from Baidu this week on their plans to make their own electric vehicles. Uh, Sean, anything from you on the the Baidu news? So yeah, I, I agree with you. And I'd like to add maybe as a concluding phrase here is that um, Baidu is definitely a very interesting company. They've been working on self-driving car technology um, for quite a while. And a book recommendation maybe on that is a book called AI Superpowers that was written by Kai-Fu Lee that is maybe now two years old. Um, and mm. that's really a great book that gives an overview of how uh, Chinese companies are working on artificial artificial intelligence. There's the mention of Baidu, and it also gives just more generally a, a very good overview of the environment, the tech ecosystem that you have in China, and how it's competitive and how it's also different and similar um, to Silicon Valley. One last anecdote from that book, which is an excellent recommendation. There's a great story in that book where Kai Fu Li is talking about a lecture that he gave at like the University of Science Technology of China in uh, in Anhui, I think, in Hefei, like one of the top universities, but also in a very poor province. And this talk was being given in something like the late 90s, early 2000s. And he walked out after the talk and it was like 7 p.m. And as it was getting dark, he saw all the students come out of the dormitories and just go and sit in the street under the streetlights with their books. And he was like, what, what the hell is going on? Uh, and then it, it occurred to him that they did not have electricity in their dorm buildings. And so they could not study after it got dark inside. And so in order to continue studying, they had street lights outside and they all left their dorms and went out in the street. And so that's, uh, if you want to study at the University of Science Technology of China, that is your, uh, that's your competition. So good luck to you. Um, anything else, John, from your side or are we good on the week? We're good for this week. Excellent. Well, with that being the case, uh, we hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Dongfang Hour Aerospace and Space News Roundup. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. Thank you very much for watching or listening, and we will see you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye.